our speaker today is Peggy. Peggy has served on the board of the North Shore Audubon Society for more than 14 years, including eight years as president and four as vice president. She is currently the society's education chair and administrator of the Bird Friendly Habitat Certification Program she started five years ago. An expert educator, Peggy frequently presents birds identification programs and native plants talk at local schools and throughout Long Island. Inspired by Douglas Tamale's book, Bringing Nature Home, Peggy has established more than a dozen public native plant gardens on Long Island. Perhaps her most unusual creation is the trio of native plants rain garden at the Science Museum of Long Island at Leeds Pond Preserve in Manhasset. In addition to advising prospective Eagle Scouts and Girl Scouts on projects involving native plants, Peggy recently started an ecosystem rehabilitation committee at the Science Museum of Long Island to remove invasive non-native plants and replace them with native plants. Tonight, Peggy is with us to talk about how to create a bird-friendly garden, and I will pass the screen share to Peggy now. Okay, this is our sign. If you have a bird-friendly habitat, you get the sign without the words in the top and the bottom. And if you have any questions, you can always write to me at nsaudubonsociety at gmail.com. Now, North Shore Audubon is... Um, bird watching group. We do a lot of bird walks Wednesday mornings and Saturday mornings. But um, if you want to go on the walks, anybody's invited and you can uh, look at our calendar. NorthShoreAudubon.org has the calendar. You go to calendar and anybody can attend the walks. For instance, tomorrow there's a walk at Hempstead Lake State Park, if anyone's interested. However, we do not just bird walks, uh, we do a lot. We have a lot of conservation, a lot of education activities. And uh, let me go, this is um, Planting Fields Arboretum. And uh, we, what happened is, this is it in 2015, it's my fourth garden, I think, third, let me look. It's the fourth one that I, uh, th there were these plants there, it was called a bird, garden and planting fields and they had all these non-native plants and this is the crew we had to remove them all and then it looks like this now now we didn't do all of this they decided to redo to in, enhance it and they have these bird blinds there were two of them there i don't know if you've been there recently uh, i think it's, it was two years ago they did this and so this is they enhanced it a bit anyway and put up the sign to help people and that's what the sign looks like. Uh, make your backyard a bird friendly habitat and how to do that and to why, why you should use native plants. So those signs are there. I don't know if you, I don't know how, how much you want me to go over that. Then what happened is I did public gardens for about, I think I, I, think I had um, for quite a few years but then um, with grants from Audubon, New York. And then Audubon, New York didn't want to give grants anymore for gardens. They wanted it for diversity. They wanted inclusion. So then we started to do have other, uh, so I stopped doing that. But uh, this is a private garden that I certified. So five years ago, I started to do that. And uh, I read this book, Bringing Nature Home. And uh, Douglas Talamay, probably 14 years ago, and he also has on YouTube a very good talk, The Little Things That Run the World. And I'll also show you another one of his talks. He's a fantastic speaker. And if you don't aren't convinced that you can do, do something to help wildlife, that he convinces you. And he convinces you it's to do things like remove some of your lawn, like plant more native plants, like don't use uh, chemicals to uh, kill insects and herbicides so he if you little things that run the world you go on youtube it's fantastic and you can read the book it's also fantastic but then i got this book i saw this man speak D donald j leopold who's the um he i think he's still the head of the department of um i'm not sure botany i'm not sure exactly what uh at um, syracuse university 
wrote this book and I heard him speak. And this book is what I use when I go to people's houses or when anyone asks me what plant should I use. So in the back is an appendix that has plants that tolerate wet, sun, shade, plants that tolerate dry. Uh, you can read it, you see that. Um, he has, and so that's the best book, best thing to use. But I didn't know if any, everybody wants to buy a book. So I started to research different ways people could find information. So this website I went on and it's uh, nationalwildfederation.org, Garden for Wildlife about Native. And um, I'll go on the site. Let's see if it works. Yep. And so on the side there is I found something amazing. Keystone plants by Echo Region. And I realized that um, there are a lot, there are, I knew this before, that some plants are better than others, native plants. And um, he says, uh, he has a list of the, this is our echo region. So here, look how many plants, oh, white oak has 436. I thought some oaks have 500. And um, you can see how many caterpillars and birds need caterpillars. So, um, to eat, to feed their young, especially. All birds feed their young insects, I think, almost all, um, except maybe piping clovers, which feed themselves. They go to the water. And I think, that, I'm not sure what they're eating, to be honest. Anyway, so this is, so what I did is I summarized this um, for you. So you don't have to go to the website, but um, I use it now when I go to people. I used it last three times I went to people's houses to uh, help them choose plants. I said, let's pick the keystone plants the best native plants. And then there's another, is, let's see, the other thing is um, you can, uh, this is a website, I, I mean, if you want to see see other plants than the ones I recommend or see pictures of the plants. A lot of them have been host plants by Echo Region. That's another interesting. And here, so let's go to, this is our area. And these again are the, the trees and the, um, the shrubs, the flowering perennials uh, that, um, that he recommends. These are the keystone ones that he recommends. Uh, also, there's um, another thing. Oh, there it is down below. Sorry, it's the same page. Oh, but before I show you that, this is the video you should also watch. Right here, you can watch his him talking. It's a great video. If you're not convinced what you should be doing, he's a fantastic speaker. So I'm not talking about why you should plant native plants. I'm not going into that. Native plant finder. So you can click here and it lists all the plants. These are the, the flowers and grasses and underneath are the trees. And it has an order of how many, um, more uh, but um, caterpillars, so it's in order caterpillars. All right, now this is a list of the plants. I I summarized that page for you, okay, and uh, you will find it. I just now put it on our Facebook page, and I'm going to try to get it on our website too. So you go to North Shore Audubon Society, the Facebook page, just like that, spell like that, and I just put this up. If you want to see. The best plants. So now when I'm going to people's houses, I'm always recommending goldenrod. Look at that. 109. It has 109 um, moths, um, caterpillars, and 42 bees that it supports. I mean, that's amazing for a goldenrod. There are different kinds of goldenrods. Um, look at blueberry. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm just some of these. And then some Plants that I really like are very low down. Like I like the last one, Blue Star, only supports one caterpillar, which I was very disappointed because that's a plant I really like. So I didn't even include a picture of it, but I, they have it at the High Line. I don't know if you've seen it at the High Line. It's a very feathery plant with little blue flowers that's not blooming yet. I'd say in two weeks, if you go to the High Line in Manhattan, they have them all over, this, this plant but it's not one of the best for, in, for helping. Now, these are the questions you wanted to know. How can you pick plants? So some will be blooming every season and which are the best plants for different conditions? So I, was, so I use the book, but so you don't have to use the book. I looked at this website 
This is where I order plants from. Where did it go? Website. It didn't come on. It, it, it didn't come on, did it? Oh, no, here it comes. Okay. So that this is, I'm a wholesaler. Um, North Shore Audubon is considered a wholesaler. So I can order these plants for you, but you don't have to order from here. But you can go here and you go down and you you go to here. It says it has the C every C uh, month bloom time. It has exposure, sun, shade, full sun, part shade. It has the heights. Uh, here it has drought tolerant. Okay, moist tolerant, wet tolerant. Um, then it has native plants. Let me find Long, Long Island Providence is like native, also, it's basically native. Uh, near native, Long Island Providence, that must be, I thought it said native, but that's it, Long Island Providence. Let me make sure that's it. So if you go to that, I thought there were more. Hmm. Because some plants I like are not, they're near native. <laughs> They're, they're from, a, you know, maybe a little west, <laughs> you know, Midwest. Um, Long Island Providence, and there are your plants that um, are, are really native. Let me get this. Whoops. Oh, wait, I clicked on one. Oh, good. Anyway, so this is, this is a website you can go to, and then it, it describes them. If you click on it, let me find one I like. I'm trying to get down on it. It won't, I'm trying to move the thing. I can't, my, uh, okay, here it goes. Okay, I love this plant. This is, I'm clicking on it now. And it'll tell you, there. So it tells you when it blooms, it tells you it needs sun. It tells you it's drought tolerant. It actually likes it dry. It doesn't like water. And it tells you other things. It doesn't list the number of uh, caterpillars, but that you can get from the other list. So you see how this helps you to decide on plants? All right. That, I hope you, you like it. I just discovered it. I mean, I use this company all the time to order plants, but I didn't realize I use their book, which I'll show. I don't know if you can see the book. This is their uh, book, but doesn't have pictures. And it, it tells the same information, but this has pictures and you could, you don't have to use the, um, I don't know if they'll send you a book. They're a wholesaler. All right. So I hope that's useful. I'm trying to get out of this. Okay. Get out of this. I'm just going to go like that and it'll come back. Let's see if it comes back. Yes. Okay. So now the next slide. This is something I just also put on the Facebook page. This is our brochure, the North Shore Audubon Society brochure I made a few years ago, five years ago when I started to go to people's houses and to help them, I listed 30 plants. And then it's, it's spring that like shade and wet, spring that like sun, summer, perennials that like sun and dry. So it lists 30 plants and I put this on the Facebook page. So that is a way to help you if you're just starting out and it, you just you don't need too many pictures. It just gets too confusing. So this covers a, these are some of my favorite plants, not all of them, but um, some and it lists what kind of plants if you want vines, if you want trees. And this is the other part of the brochure of bird friendly habitat certification. Okay. Now, this is when I go to a yard, these are things I'm looking for. I don't know if you're interested in this stuff. Um, you know, how many native plants do you use? Do you compost? Do you use soaker hoses? Uh, do you utilize rainwater? Do you use leaves as mulch? No pesticide use. I mean, do you have some brush piles? Most people don't like to have a brush pile, some dead snags. <laughs> so that's good for some birds. And then percentage of canopy trees that are native, percentage of shrubs that are native. Um, and then I, how much is there an unnatural area under shrubs and, and that you, should, you need to leave some, uh, some mulch and stuff under things for birds to like dig around. And this is deductions. So this is if you have a lot of um, invasive non-natives or cats, that you're feeding feral cats, then you get deductions. And then if you get a 65%, <laughs> you get certified. This 
this in our webpage, NorthshoreAudubon.org. This, this uh, lists 10 plants, and you can see it has, um, this is the symbol for provides food for migratory birds. I'm looking up here, you see my pointer? This is um, attracts and supports native birds. This is uh, tolerates, that's part shade. This is sun and then moist. That's called, um, oh, it, it's the Latin name. It's only the Latin name. Oh, uh, yeah, it's called winter berry. So it has, this is the, the name of the, the Latin name that the gardeners use, that the wholesalers use, but it has the common name too. So this is, this is on our website. NorthshoreAudubon.org under, um, so you can find that there if that's 10 plants and it tells you everything you need to know as far as sun, moisture, and does it tell the season? It doesn't say the season, does it? Okay. Oh yeah. No, it says the season flowers June through August. Okay. And that's the, there are 10 plants. So six on one page and four in the other, but I'm going to go through these plants um, now, uh, I don't have, I didn't have dogwood. I picture a dogwood or bayberry there or if I burn them, I think I'm trying to think I didn't for some reason. All right. So I'm going to start with the white oak. Um, I, he said 400 and something. I thought it was 550, but it's up there. Oaks are the best plants for birds. They have the most, um, caterpillars. And I was just birding at Sands Point Preserve. It's in Sands Point, Washington this morning. And there were so many birds in the oak trees. It was just like, we were there five hours <laughs> birding. And I mean, I had to leave because I had to go somewhere, an appointment. But um, it was just, you could, you could just stay there forever. There were so many birds. This is an oak in my own yard. It's much bigger now. It's actually taller than my house now. This when I first took this picture and did my first a talk on this subject um, a few years ago. Uh, it was smaller, but the this was planted by squirrels. I have seven or eight of these in my yard. Oak trees planted by squirrels, and I just leave them there. And if they're in the side, you know, I dig them up if they're in my lawn and repot them, and try to plant them somewhere else. But oak trees are the very best. If you can have an oak tree, that's what you do. Now look at high bush blueberry and you see how many um what happens is the pictures of people are blocking the numbers on my screen so i don't see how many numbers it's 20 something 200 something right 200 so that high bush blueberry is i, I couldn't believe that's one of the best goldenrod again one of the best and Sol solidago numeralis that's the one it's short that's a short one so it doesn't flop over. A lot of people hate when they flop. Uh, this is one I love, um, Lugoso, because it's very delicate and sort of, it's it doesn't flop much. That's in my yard. So goldenrod is like, I just a must have, I think for anybody. This is a great little tree. I don't know if you can tell how small it is. If this was near uh, where I go birding, um, somebody planted along, uh, I guess it was a landscape architect, along their whole driveway planted, must be 10 of them, and it looks gorgeous. And it has fruit. It's just a fantastic tree. Serviceberry, Amelanchier, Canandensis, I think is the one. Um, woodland sunflower, again, 70 caterpillars, 50 bees, different kinds of bees it supports. And this is a tall thing that can flop but you just stake it. This is inkberry and um, it, it gets berries if you have a male and a female. And uh, this is in front of my house, that's my house. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. This is actually much bigger now. That's the front of my house. You see the inkberry in the back, you see it? This is a, 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 a trumpet honeysuckle. That's a native that um, is just, Fantastic. It not only is 39 more um, caterpillars, but also hummingbirds go to this. This is uh, Joe Pie Weed. And no, this is very tall. It can be very tall. You might be able to buy short ones, but I love it. It's just, it's huge. It's taller than me. I'm five, seven, <laughs> and it gets taller than me. There, that's in my yard. This is a vine. This is growing on a fence. I think that's my fence, even. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's mine. I can't. Anyway, um, 
and it has berries, but in the fall, it's beautiful and it's red. And it, if it climbs on bushes or trees, it doesn't harm them like um, other ivies, like English ivy. It's, it's, it can climb, it has sticky things, it climbs, but it doesn't strangle or kill anything. Uh, geranium, it can grow in shade, by the way, and this is the, that's what it looks like. The flower looks huge, it's not that big. That's a spring plant. I don't know if you want to take notes or, you, okay. Hibiscus likes water. It's gorgeous, late summer. Uh, Black-eyed Susan. These are the, the plants that I think are the best. So that's why I'm listing them. That's what it, in my yard, that's what it looks like. In the, I love this plant. I love the color. This is spring. Uh, blue false indigo. It gets big and bushy. It, but then it all dies back and starts all over again in the spring. Just all dies back. It gets very big. Little blue stem, this is a grass, but it supports 20 um, caterpillars. So grasses are nice in the winter. It's some interest in the winter. It looks delicate and nice in the winter. This is butterfly weed, and that's a monarch butterfly, uh, caterpillar. This is it again. It, it's I love it because you don't have to water it. It really doesn't like water. So if you have a place that doesn't get water and sunny, um, swamp milkweed needs water. And again, this is uh, for um, monarchs. Uh, I have a problem with this. Rabbits eat it. They eat the leaves. So if you have rabbits, I don't know. <laughs> they can be a problem. This is the science museum, and we had. Hundreds of them. We planted a whole bunch of them. We got it from somewhere we got free. And we have almost none left. The rabbits have um, done a number on it. It's really sad. So I've had to, I, I put little cages around them now. <laughs> Columbine is blooming now. And if you go, the, I don't know if you're not in the area, but if you go to the Science of Museum in Long Island now or in the next week, we have a huge stretch of this and it's stunning. I think I have a picture. No, I don't have a picture of it. But that's, um, I have a huge stretch of it. And it just looks gorgeous. And I've seen hummingbirds come to those. And you saw the bee in it. I had one with a bee. That's a bee in there. <laughs> you see him? His butt. Okay, there's Clethra. 11. This is the summer plant. This is um, wild bergamot. It's very pretty. This is a picture of it. This is one of the gardens at Science Museum. Uh, it can fall over. This one too, people hate it when they have to stake things. And there's a hummingbird. Aster, one of my all-time favorite plants. And Aster spectabilis is a short one. So it doesn't fall over. They're different colors, different types. This is someone's yard where she had a lawn and I'm going to show it to you. This is the aster. This is this is um, New, New York aster, I think. Or is it New England? It's one of them. And this is what it looked like before, as they were about to plant. She said, I want to get rid of grass. So this is 9 by 33 to show you. And they we ordered plants. And you see in the corner, can I point my pointer? Where's my pointer? My cursor. Where are you, cursor? Well, you see the purple in the corner? That's those plants. I think two or three years before, two and a half years before I took the picture, okay? Um, we did a, we did a, you can see we did um, a, a plan and uh, for every season, this is a, her neighbor about two, a block and a half away said, oh, I want to do that too. <laughs> so she did the same thing. This is her plan. Okay, we're back to plants again. Coneflower is everybody's favorite. Sneezeweed, I think this looks great. It's it's late summer. This is spring, and I love this plant, but again, rabbits have been eating it. This, this is blooming now, and I love it. This is the I this is stunning, right? Phlox subulata, right? It's and it's evergreen. Both of these are evergreen. That's evergreen, and I replaced Vinca. With that, I took out my vinca and replaced that, and I put this also, the phlox uh, subulata. Cardinal flower, do I have? I didn't say how many. Uh, I forgot to put the number, or it's at the side and I can't see it. This is this attracts hummingbirds. 
all the time. You, it never fails. Prickly pear cactus is has a gorgeous flower, and it's it can be very interesting looking. This is in my yard. Um, it lies flat in the winter, and then as it warms up, it starts to stand up, and then the flowers come. And this is um, I think this looks gorgeous. I this is this is um, molly grass, right? This is in the fall. It does this. Cup plant was not listed, and I. I don't know why um, it's in his, the book I told you about, uh, and it's a wonderful plant. It blooms forever. It, it starts in June and keeps blooming through September. Um, this is a fall plant that um, it's small, but it, you put it in the shade and it just spreads and there are bees all over it. This is uh, he, also not in his book, and it may be because it's more Southern or more Midwestern, but it's gorgeous. It's all over Central Park in their native plant gardens, oak leaf hydrangea. The leaves turn gorgeous red in the fall. Beautyberry again is not in his book. So I don't know how, and it's not, it's not, it's in his book. It's in the book, but it's not in the um, website that has the number of caterpillars. It's in the book, but not, uh, in the uh, website that has the caterpillars, the National Wildlife Federation website. Why they don't include it, I don't know, but it's in the, the book that I have. And this one is also, this is a shade loving plant that's very popular for old flower. Again, not, we don't know how many moths. And this one too, this is blooming right now. I think I just took this picture. This is my yard, <laughs> right? I think a day or two ago. ago. And this has a, a butterfly that depends on it, but it also can go, uh, uses dill. I think it's a tiger swallowtail. I forget the name of the butterfly. But again, it, I know it, it attracts moths, uh, uh, caterpillars. Now I'm showing you plants that I removed. So this is before I removed them. This is vinca and um, uh, what's it called? Tiger lily, the orange lilies. And I put cardboard over them. And uh, then I put covered them with, well, I might have pulled them out first. And now those plants, by the way, are doing great. <laughs> um, this is this is actually pokeweed, which is a good plant, but people pull it out. I should have put this before. I'm sorry, I put it in the wrong one. Um, but, uh, you know, people, it's big, it's not very pretty, but it, the, the birds like it a lot and the insects. Now here's, this is at the high school, Schreiber High School. They had lots of invasives. Oriental bittersweet, this is stuff you wanna get rid of. Kudzu, anyone have kudzu or seen it? We had, this is at the science museum. We had someone kind of come with big trucks and dig it out. Now porcelain berry has two kinds of leaves. You see the leaves that are kind of indented and then it le has leaves that are not so indented when it's more young, younger. And this is Japanese knotweed. These are the bad guys. Mugwort. Garlic mustard is easy to control though. I had it in my yard and I just kept pulling it out. It pulls out very easy, easily and I have none left. I just, just kept doing it before. And this is multifloral rose, which is terrible. That's that. All right. And this is someone's yard at a, um, she rents in, a, in Great Neck and she wanted to do a native plant garden. So she's doing it. You don't have to own the land, you know, you can do it anywhere. Now this is, CBS did a, um, uh, did a, a broadcast on the people. I showed you the lawns that people dug up and planted native plants. And, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be hot. It doesn't seem to work, the video. Uh, it just, it has the text of it though. It doesn't, you see, it doesn't have a, so it just has the text and that's it. Oh, wait, how do I get out of this? Oh, here I go again. <laughs> so uh, now that's my yard and I'll end there, my front yard, right by the street. And I'll end there and look for, and look at questions. And um, you want to, okay, I'll just go to chat chat on okay okay you have a very beautiful yard 
Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. I, well, and, the secret is I've been doing it for like 13 years. <laughs> yes. I've been slowly so. removing invasive plants. So in that corner where you see the, um, let's see, I, I got to take this. I got to take this. I can't find my cursor. I'm trying to see the, the corner. I can't see my, all right. Where's my cursor? Okay, it's coming. Okay, I'm trying to get rid of the chat thing so I can see the plants. I'm trying to see it. Oh, all right, I was on it. There. Okay, I here's see Joe Pie Weed. You have. Yeah, and to the side, I can't get the chat thing off. Why can't I move it? I'm trying to get the chat thing off so I can see. There should be a little arrow that you could yeah, well, click yeah. on. Sorry. I thought I could see my curse. Oh, an arrow on the side. Okay, that arrow down here. I can't get rid of it. So I can't, anyway, there was, um, I don't know if it still shows you, but I had, um, this might be an older thing where I had a uh, Siberian iris and I dug it all up and that was hard. And I planted a whole bunch of new native plants. Yeah, there. I don't know, and that picture might still be there because that this was taken a while ago. So, um, okay, so I'm looking at questions now, right? I mean, you, if people want to put themselves on, uh, they could also ask questions. Okay, 11 messages I'm looking at. Yes, so if you have questions, you can type it in or you can unmute yourself and... Okay, recording is on. I can't, why can't I get to the messages? Sorry, I'm having a lot of trouble dealing with this. So... Did you um, want to read the messages to me? I can't see them. Sure, I can, I can read it out. Um, For some reason I can't get to them. I had, there's, you know, there's certain things that we... This is more short on society, sorry. <laughs> okay, yes, go ahead. Um, you can stop screen share if you like. Okay. So... Uh, I thought I'd leave the picture up. People will have questions about the picture. Can, can you tell us more about bird strike and how we can prevent them? Oh, bird strikes. Okay, so I have on my window... Oh, I didn't know that was... You didn't put that as one of the things. Oh, so, but well, you have um, featherfriendly.com is a company. It's in Quebec, I think. And, um, but they do English, you know, both languages. And they send you a roll of, um, it has little stickers that you put in in a roll down your, your windows. And it has to, they're four inches apart. And you put each strip four inches apart. And they're little tiny squares. I mean, they're really small, like a, but that's enough. You put on the outside and that is enough to deter birds. I have them on my, um, my screen, my door, my uh, sliding glass doors, but I've seen houses that have like a lot of bird feeders. They have them on every window and Garvey's Point Preserve. They also now have them. We paid for it. North Shore Audubon paid for them to put it on every window because they have a lot of glass in their buildings. Garvey's Point Preserve is in Glen Cove. So um, that's what you do. It's 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 just little dots. And um, it, it that will stop bird strikes. Because what happens is if you have um, a window that has a reflection, like trees are near it or something, the bird flies into it thinking it's a reflection. It's it's not a reflection. Thinks it's a real tree. That's the problem. So I've had I've had birds die, hit the window, but usually it's because I have a Cooper's hawk that jumps, goes to the feeder, and chases them, and they just go boom, and they hit the window. It hasn't happened often. You know, they don't even look. <laughs> They're just so scared they just fly. But usually they avoid it. I haven't had hardly any since I've been putting that up. Sometimes I would see the impression of a bird on my uh, sliding glass doors because they have oil on their skin. <laughs> so I know they've been up against them, but they, I didn't see dead bodies. Yeah. But so, but it's so it's good to put the, featherfriendly.com uh, is the company that's um, Audubon likes them. And that's what I recommend. And it's a roll of, it's a roll, you know, like a, looks like tape roll mm -hmm. and you and it, and you put it you undo the backing and it tapes on and then it, it comes off too you put the um the little things stay on 
and the top part comes off. So the little things are separate. The little tiny squares or circles. I think the, the I have squares. Okay, more questions? Do you see the ones here? Yeah. Do you have, um, still have bird feeders? When you have all native plants in your yard, like yes. what I'm looking to do is- oh, I don't have all native plants. <laughs> well, all right, well, you have a lot of native plants. I have a lot, yes, because I'm slowly changing it. That's yeah, what's the problem. You can't do it all my, at once. My goal would be not to have bird feeders at all and have enough insects in my yard that I wouldn't have to feed the birds with bird seed. That's my goal. Is that a possible, is that a realistic goal? No, because, well, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. Because in the winter, there are no insects. Oh, not in the winter. I just mean, in, yeah, oh. I, I only mean in the summer. But what I have a friend who says, who, a birder, um, has President of Audubon, very knowledgeable. She says, you, I leave my feeders out all the time because she says the adult birds have to eat and they're working so hard to feed their young, it helps the adult birds. If they're seed eaters, cedar or seed or suet eaters. Um, I mean, people put out fruit and jelly and peanut butter too. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> okay. For other kind of birds like Orioles. I've had or Orioles visit and I quickly found an orange, stuck it out. Yeah, they like fruit, right? Yeah, yeah but he it didn't come back to eat the fruit. It never touched it. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know. So, but if you put fruit out like oranges, uh, but then I have um, a hummingbird feeder. So I get hummingbirds. There's a plant that I didn't show you. That's um, a annual called jewelweed. Have you ever heard of it? It has no. little orange flowers and no. you actually, you can go in the woods in the fall and um, they have the jewelweed has little pods after it flowers with the seeds and you can, and they pop, you can collect the seeds and plant them. Or, I mean, if you come to Science Museum of Long Island, we have so much, you can dig up little ones. <laughs> you can just dig them up. But there, we have so much, We plant. I, it just spreads like crazy. It likes it wet, it likes shade. And it has little orange. Uh, I didn't put them in, I could have put a picture in, but it's not a great picture of a hummingbird with their head stuck in it in my yard. <laughs> I have that right in my yard. I have I, I put have the jewelweed. I took one plant from a path at Sands Point Preserve. It was in the middle of the path. So I figured they won't miss it. You know, they'll someone will step <laughs> on it. Planted it maybe four years ago. Well, I have thousands of this plant now. It just the seeds pop and they spread. It's great. And they're very easy to pull out if you don't want them. They're not particularly gorgeous. They're fairly tall, but they don't fall over. And it's a little tiny orange flower, but hummingbirds just love it. It's an annual, so okay. you know, it, it spreads by its seed. It respreads. It's it's the greatest plant uh, for shade, for shade. But it needs it needs to be wet. But shade, and it will be in the sun. But then you got to water it more. It really it kind of wilts a little if you don't. So um, it likes the likes the shade. It likes shade. Yeah, I got shade. <laughs> oh, you will love it. You'll love it. So uh, do you live near Sands? Um, do you live near? I'm on the, I'm on the South Shore. I'm, oh, yeah. Okay. So, I'm but Science away. Museum, well, is um, Plandome, Manhasset. Have you ever come that way? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I go to Sands Point once in a blue moon too. But... Okay, but, but this is closer to Sands Point. I don't know if you're, they'll let you pick there. Um, <laughs> but I'm saying you can come <laughs> I... and dig up. But you have to do when they're young. Like if you do it too much later, they really don't do well. They do very well if you pick them up when they're really little, you know, and mm -hmm. transplant them. Then they're easy to transplant and then they'll get. Okay. So, but you can come get the seeds in, in the, like, I guess around October, the so end of October that you'll see there's all these little seed pods on them. And then you get those at Tans Point. They're right by the pond in Tans Point. By the north end of the pond is a whole bunch. And I, people, I've taken seeds from there and given them to people. Okay. So, okay. So, speaking Which of gardens, do you have a do you have a list of certified gardens, and do you revisit them to ensure that they still maintain? Oh, no. <laughs> Once I certify them, they can call me again, and I go back. So there's one guy I was birding with this morning said, "I need you to come back. I want to do more." So I'll go back. That's all. I don't. Once they're certified, I don't check on them anymore. <laughs> no. And 
because once they're certified, they, they probably have a lot of native plants. Sometimes somebody who has the first house I ever did in Great Neck was a big property and she had seven oak trees, full grown oak trees. That to me is, that's all you need. That, you know, how many birds that supports? So she was getting, she was buying anyway, some native plants too. And she had a stream in the back and some mallards were sitting in it. <laughs> so, I mean, she had this ideal yard, Even, you know, she had some grass, a lot of grass still. And we talked about replacing grass and replacing some things, but she just, and she was going to replace things, but I certified her. She had huge oak trees and they were gorgeous. So if you look up now, the oak trees are dripping these, um, uh, what are they called? They have a special name, these, these little okay. flowers. Those flowers, yes. Yeah, they're little flowers and the insects are in there and the birds are in there. You should, they're all over them. And, and the caterpillars are going to be in there too. I mean, well, caterpillars eat the leaves. Caterpillars eat the leaves. I mean, 500 varieties of caterpillars. That's bird food, bird food. So, so um, but I have, I would suggest I have public gardens. For instance, planting fields has, a, they call it a bird garden. That's a really nice garden if you want to look at plants. And I don't, I don't know if they have name tags on them, but you know who has name tags is, um, uh, but you use the plant identifier to use the um, what's it called iNaturalist you put it and take a picture of the plant and then it it asks some questions and then it tells you what the plant it thinks it is it's not always correct but if you see a plant you like you can do that or, or if you have a plant you don't like you want to know is it native and what's its name and should you remove it iNaturalist it's a free app you can download and um, that's very helpful but Gardens that have name tags, you know, ID tags are useful. Like the, um, I haven't been to Brooklyn Botanical Gardens in a while. So I think, but I think they have, but I know New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx is, has a native plant area. It's a woods, it's gorgeous, it's stunning. It has this water feature that is, it's huge that goes through it. It's, it's, if you have, net, how many people have been to that? The, uh, I don't know, raise hand. You don't have, hand. I don't see many people, but um, that is New York Botanical Garden is worth going every season to the native plant garden there. And of course there are other non-native plants lot there, but that's, that, that's where I started going and taking pictures and they had the name tags. And that's where I got a lot of my education. That's where I learned about, they have a lot of, um, I didn't have a picture of the iris, did I? Crest, dwarf crested iris. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't show that, okay. But that's where I saw them in the shade under a lot of their trees in the garden. I didn't include it because it's not a, a key, keystone plant, but if you have a shaded area that you want a short plant and it blooms now, it's little tiny irises, little, little iris flowers, little iris, that they have tons of it at the um, the uh, New York Botanical Garden, and that's that's a really pretty nice plant. So that's I learned about that there. I I mean I saw a plant. I said, wow, that looks like a great plant, you know. So I, that's that. If you go to those places and in the ones we did, I did native plant gardens here. So Garvey's Point has a native plant garden in Glen Cove. Um, the ones I did, let's say I have a list of ones I did. Um, Clark Gardens has a lot in, that's in um, the North Shore. I can, that's the, I, can, I can follow up with you if you can to uh, send us a list and I can send it out to everybody. Oh, the gardens? That, the would gardens. Be, okay. that would be great. Okay. So we have a few more questions. Okay, go ahead. How do we create a bird-friendly yard without encouraging rats? Okay, yeah, so... I did have rats and I had someone come with an exterminator, uh, with not exterminator, with a rat trap and he poisoned them and uh, they haven't been back. Um, I have also compost, but I have closed areas for compost. Um, I have, I, you mean they eat the bird seed? Yes. And the bird speaking seed. of bird feeders, um, do you yeah, have bird a seed. bird feeder that you suggest? The, oh, I have a bird feeder called, yes, the bird feeder is, again, it's a company in Quebec called Squirrel Buster. 
And the company is B R O O M E. But you look up Squirrel Buster, and but you can get it from different stores. They're not cheap, but uh, you could put the pieces in the all the parts come apart, and you can put in the dishwasher if you want to clean it. And it, um, I just broke the the plastic part, the big plastic part, and they sent me a new one free. So it's like it's a lifetime guarantee warranty. Wow. When you buy. So it's going to cost $100 for a, a bird feeder, but that's it. It's it's lasts forever. It's, and where do you suggest we put them? What's the best place? Oh, you hang it from somewhere. You hang it. Um, you, I put it on a post. I have another company called ERVA, Irva, which makes like poles, but you can poles and then a, a hook. Um, oh, see, I didn't know you wanted that in part of the talk. So I could have shown you pictures of that. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Um, the company I've been going to, see if I can remember, uh, to buy the ERVA. I used to go to, um, oh, there was a company and I'm sorry, I don't remember. And it's not gonna come to me today. I'm gonna have to send you an email. Sure, that's uh, fine. Company, but. But I, but then I found another at a bird store. Like you go to the bird, the wild bird stores, you know, the, the wild um, bird stores, what are they called? There's several, there's one in Syasset, Wild Birds Unlimited, stores like that. They have poles with a hook. Sometimes they have four hooks. I like four hooks because you can hang four different things. And I even hang the uh, suet holder from it. And I use for suet, I use with, uh, you all know to use red pepper suet, more expensive, but then the raccoons and the squirrels can't eat it because uh, the red pepper makes their eyes burn. <laughs> and if you touch it and then touch your eye, your eye will burn. So wash your hands after you touch it. That's suet. Yeah, rats. I don't have a problem now, I'm pretty sure. Um, but I did have one and uh, he came and he trapped them and poisoned them and um that's a problem yeah with bird seed yeah i don't know the answer but um that's why some people stop because of that um okay more questions do you want to read them or someone had just yeah. asked about the name of the little iris dwarf crested iris and if you want i think you want the latin name or by the way um Oh, gee, I can't, the other book has the Latin name. Um, Here's a question about um, yeah. the flux that you use to replace the vinca minor. Okay, oh, the flux. Flux subulata, I think it's called moss flux. Subulata, moss uh, flux subulata. It's gorgeous, right? That flux that, that sort of spreads out. And the yeah. other flux that the, if the flower stands up a little more, and that's a shade, this... The flock subulata is for sun. The other flocks that I used to replace my vinca was in the shade, was flocks stolen, S T O uh, stole L O N, stolen ephera, and stolen S T O L O N I F E R A, stolen ephera, flocks stolen ephera. I could. And do you have a choice for replacing yes. pivots? Replacing privets oh i ripped out all my privets i ripped out all my privet uh what did i you replace it with uh what did i replace my privets with see i had what did i do see that was before i knew native plants and i just hated privet so i replaced it with uh something that wasn't native <laughs> but if you um there is do you want evergreen okay so there's some viburnum Viburnum nudum, arrowwood viburnum, is um, very tall and bushy. Um, viburnums get big and bushy. That's a really nice one. Uh, you also, but if you want an evergreen, there is a Canadian yew. Now I've never used it. It's native. I'm not. You know what yews look like, right? I'm not sure how it does as a hedge, so I don't know, but I just learned about it recently. Hemlock is uh, makes a really you know nice, but hemlock is a tree, 
So then you have to keep cutting it back. So I have a hemlock hedge that my neighbor planted. And my son came along and I said, I, it's too big, can you cut it? And he cut the top off. And basically, he, I think he killed a few of them because <laughs> it's a tree and it doesn't like that. So yeah, if I, he cut it where it was too, already grown too big. It was like a trunk already. And it didn't like that at all. So, um, but it's still doing well. It still was so thick that, um, but then it gets this white insect hemlock lately and you have to spray it. However, I didn't have to spray mine last year. So it's hard to recommend hemlock. How tall a hedge <laughs> are you thinking? I guess it all depends on, you know, the condition of the yard also. Well, there's some really good bushes, like the bushes that grow in the shade. Such yeah, I had the I had the hedge question. So I've been I yeah. have a, I've, I'm on a busy road and I had talked to Kimberly Simmon. Like I was thinking about inkberry, but I don't oh. know. It gets straggly. I don't have a lot of depth, so I can't really do. Um, I could do like an arborvitae. Um, <clears throat> and I did put a native garden on the street, but I just, we get a lot of foot traffic and a lot of noise. So I was trying to do something that's native. I don't think it's possible. I was trying to do something. Oh, hemlock, hemlock is good, but you, you have to trick, keep, if you don't want it too tall, just get it before it's like a tree on top, you know, yeah. get loose branches. Then <laughs> and hemlock, you might have to spray it. It gets a, an insect, a little white insect. That's, I that's, have a I have a hemlock and it's beautiful. I don't, but it can get too big for that spot. Well, if you keep trimming it, because when it's loose and fluffy, because I have a hemlock hedge now that I've you had do? years. I mean, the guy planted it when my son was my son's forty five, gonna be and he was like in a he wasn't walking yet. <laughs> he was under one year old when the guy planted. It. It's 40 something years old and now because we just we hired I could do it myself, but the guy with borders the, the new neighbor and he hires someone and they do a beautiful job and they trim it. And so it well, stays the same height. It's not getting bigger and it's thick and it's gorgeous. But again, it okay. gets you, you know the disease. So right. hemlock, hemlock is one of the best plants from for insects, believe that. Okay for um caterpillars it's i didn't put it in because of the problem with the little white insect i think it's pear pear yeah. or something yeah so yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't. I didn't include it but it's one of the best for caterpillars you just have okay. to control it yourself you get a hedge cutter yourself and just trim it when it's loose and fluffy you know okay. and it's already my son had a saw off the top he was sawing off the tops for me yeah. And um, that they some of them didn't like that at all. Yeah. <laughs> they were went into shock or something, or right. it was the pear clips that did them in. So, but we still had so many. I think I pulled out about three or four dead ones. But out of like a row, I mean, it goes the whole yards. Up. Well, it's like a hundred feet of them, maybe or maybe it's less. It's a lot. He planted this. My neighbor planted them. He wanted. He loved evergreens. He wanted privacy. Right. So, yeah. Okay, any okay. more questions? Thank yes. you. About okay. marshmallows uh, in the garden photo you have. Okay. Uh, does it grow oh, in the uh, yeah. yard? Rose, rose mallow, rose mallow. mallow. Rose mallow, right? Rose mallow. Yeah, marshmallow. Is it called marshmallow? No, rose mallow. It could can, be can it grow in drier yards? Like it's got to have water. Yeah, I have um, soaker things in there, like irrigation soakers on a timer. Like, you know, I have the real stuff. I just had it installed, in fact, because... Um, I wanted, I have zones, I have real irrigation. So, um, but I didn't have the sprinkler kind. I, you know, that spray, I had it done in the, around on the ground. And a, can I ask you about a bird bath? It, does it yeah, need yeah. a water feature, a bubbler? Does it really attract the birds? Like Yes, I think it does. I have one. I think it does. The sound of water. Oh yeah. I walk out my window sometimes and I see them I saw them bathing, splashing around and drinking from it all the time. But I, I think, and I really, the sound of water does attract birds. And so you can see them and they need water too. So, and it keeps the mosquitoes out because it, the water's moving. So it doesn't have mosquitoes. So if it's constantly moving the water and it, okay. I know, are we running out of time or you're, I'm okay. Yes. <laughs> Iris Custada, yeah, Iris Custada. Yeah, that's the, the iris. It's also called, Crested iris, 
And some, and I have two kinds. One is just crested iris and the other is dwarf crested iris. And I, I think one's a little taller than the other. So I, so I look, this is all by um, experimenting, all by experience. All, I've been doing this for years now. And I still have, I look out and I still have azaleas that are not native. And I have, you know, but it's, I, I just removed 30 hostas last week uh, because I said, it's time to remove the hostas. It's, you know, I left a few that were really big and fancy, but um, I, I removed, and I know the flowers do attract bees sometimes, but I, I planted other things that I thought were more important to plant. So, and I threw them out. I'm not going to give them to someone. They should get a native plant. <laughs> <laughs> so you you had a blog about it on Rewild Long Island. So I'm going to put it here so everybody can read oh, yeah. about it. Did I update it? I I tried to update it, but I couldn't. I will I can follow up with you on the updates, but this I three years, four it. years I ago. Because you asked me to. And I <laughs> yeah, so this was so when I put that in was a few years ago. So now it's 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been just working constantly for 10 years. I still have. I don't know if it's even half native plants. It's a quarter acre and my house isn't that big. So, you know, I have a lot of places to plant. And I still have lawn. You see the lawn? And I put my native garden in the front so that neighbors will be influenced. <laughs> That's what I was hoping. And sure enough, people stop by. Oh, my wife loves your garden. And oh, I just got landscapers. I didn't realize because I just moved in. And oh, I didn't realize I could do this. <laughs> stuff like that you know so I've gotten some people I have one lady on the block who's my friend who has native plants <laughs> but some people like I, I planted um goldenrod in uh, down the block and he said um they flop over I don't want them dig them up <laughs> <laughs> so I, I dug them up and gave to someone else his goldenrod so I some people don't like things when they flop they have to stake them it's annoying so um so I'm, I know short plants now. They're short goldenrods. They're short asters. They're hybrids, or what is it called? Hybrids? No, it's got another name. So that I don't know if they have the same benefits for insects, but I'm sure it's close. You know, they, this they're they're genetically very similar. So I'm assuming it's close. Okay. So I'm just letting everybody know this recording will be up on our website. And okay. our YouTube channel. And, and they will see the pictures and the plants. So the right. And yeah. all these are named in the um uh actually I don't know where they're named. <laughs> um, but they're in uh, they're in the different um no, but you can look in it and see. You'll see the names. I didn't list all the plants I had here, did I? Anywhere? No. But I listed you you saw the list of the best plants. Yeah, that to me, I just came across that about two weeks ago. So I now take that list with me every time I go to someone's house and say, you know, these are the best plants. You can have others, but if you want the bet, the ones that have the most caterpillars. And I didn't used to do that. So it, do, preparing for this talk got me into that, which is, I always knew Goldenrod was really good because um, Douglas Talamay had, used to have this website, um, Bringing Nature Home. But I don't, and he listed perennials and in order of which were the best. But he it doesn't he doesn't have that. I think he switched to different websites now. Yeah. If you put that in, you get um, Homegrown National Park, which is another interesting site. Homegrown National Park. That's his site to promote everybody planting native plants. But I highly recommend everybody see the videos that he of his talks, like the one that's on NationalWildlifeFederation.org. I mean, he's paid $2,000 to give a talk, guys. <laughs> so you can see it for free. I mean, people people don't pay that, but I know um, Cape Fear Audubon had him speak and I know he charges a huge amount of money to speak. So he's, cause he's really good and they had the money, so they paid him. And then they, they gave everybody a recording if you wanted it. So I had a CD of his talk that he gave there, but you can see it on YouTube now. You can go to that website and see it some of his talks. He has several different talks. And each time I see it, I think he gets he gets better at it. And he's really good. He's just, he makes you realize you have to do this. 
you have to have native plants and you have to try to convince people and use and you should use the keystone plants if you can any other questions no that's it for tonight it. no one okay thank you so okay. much thank you so yes much. so you if, if you have any questions on why you should do this i didn't go into that at all you have to see his videos because he's much better at it than anyone i know so I he could... convinces me so that's yeah you're convincing <laughs> yeah. right all right thank you so thank much thank you everybody have a good okay, night bye